And now, we know that this year's conventions will be memorable for being so different, but throughout history, these nominating parties have generated moments that still burn bright to this day. Our next guests are perfectly positioned to curate this retrospective. Dan Rather was the longtime anchor of the CBS Evening News, and Margaret Carlson, a columnist for the Daily Beast now, was the first female columnist for Time magazine. Here they are speaking with our Walter Isaacson about some of their standout moments of the past. Thank you, Christian and Margaret Carlson and Dan Rather. Welcome to the show, both of you. Thank you. Good to be with you, Walter. We go a long way back on conventions, and I remember all of us always saying, these things are so pointless. They don't really have any meaning in this day and age. But now, what do you think we might be losing if we don't have these type of uh, in-person conventions? Well, we lose a lot of uh, focus these two weeks that give us focus and kind of a national teach-in, if you will, or a master class in politics of what our democracy hopes to be and thinks it can be and thinks it is. The other thing we miss is, is the sheer joy of it. The conventions are part of what I call the dance of democracy. And now with this unprecedented virtual convention today, sort of the music has gone out of the dance, but we're still doing the steps, if you follow that, that metaphor. The parties could decide going forward that the old-fashioned, let's go to a city convention is a thing of the past. It's one of the unknowns as we go forward. But certainly I personally, as a journalist, miss the conventions. You know, the, even the hullabaloo and the bull shine from, from the podiums and the balloons and the crowds. And yes, I, meant, uh, I miss the bar that opens at 11 o'clock in the morning and the chance to really smooth with politicians. But there was a sense of the old-fashioned conventions before we moved to this virtual form. Things did get decided there, certainly in the earlier part of the mid-century, of the 20th century, that when John Kennedy chose Lyndon Johnson to be his running mate at the 1960 convention, uh, in Los Angeles. What a stunner. I mean, only if the Pope had turned Baptist would you have been any more surprised than you would have been surprised at that. And with the tumultuous uh, atmosphere of both the conventions in 1968, the Democrats more than the Republicans, but the, the, there with the whole world watching, America's divisions were right there on the television screen. I mean, Things were actually decided at conventions, but the time we got post-1980, in 1980, when Ted Kennedy made a run at incumbent President Carter, and a pretty good run, I would argue that may be the last convention in which, at the convention, something really important was actually decided. Uh, but even the ones that came after 1980, there, there is a, a certain excitement that I think reflects the country wanting to focus on who we want to be, where we want to go, and who we want to take us there. You know, Margaret, every now and then the surprise is the 1988 convention down here in New Orleans. And I think uh, you and I were together, we were in charge of figuring out who the vice president was going to be. And suddenly one day before he was supposed to announce it, Bush announces Dan Quayle, and you had to scramble. Oh, did we ever? Because the only thing we heard from the Bush people was how much uh, Senator Ted Kennedy respected Dan Quayle for their work on the on the Labor Committee. Uh, we didn't know much. You know, he's a a, a, a decent guy, a quiet guy uh, from Indiana, and you know the there was a little suspense. Is in Dan's day, there was a lot more than in mine. But the vice presidential pick was sometimes held to the very end uh, yeah. instead of, uh, well, when is he going to say it? And if, the, and if the presidential candidate doesn't reveal it, what's wrong with, what's wrong with that, that campaign that they can't get themselves together to announce this? Uh, but now, mostly, that, that element is gone. Another element that's going to be gone this time is uh, last week when I was watching the Biden-Harris rollout, at the end of it, they waved the way you know, the professional wave, and then you see somebody you went to camp with in the audience and you start pointing. Gone. They were waving to an empty room, just about, except for a few friends and family and, and, and the, few pre the, the, the press pool that got in. So you ask, what's, you know, what's the sound of no hands clapping? Right. And, it, it, and, the, and the clapping in the audience, it 
really creates something all on its own. And Walter, I remember you not as a dancer or a music guy, but when the balloons dropped, you kind of went with the music because it's a great moment when the family comes one by one until the whole stage is full and then you see Bush's fourth cousin, twice removed, is out there on the fringes. And um, one I remember that went on forever was the don't stop thinking about tomorrow. Mm. And uh, we're not gonna have that. You know, one of the most memorable modern moments in the convention was 1968. And you were a new CBS News correspondent on the floor, Dan. You were covering the White House, I think. And you were one of those floor correspondents. And you got dragged out with Walter Cronkite narrating. Tell me how that happened. Well, there was a great uh, effort to keep the lid on in Chicago. That inside the hall, Mary Daly, the Chicago mayor, uh, was in cahoots, if I can use a Texas word, with the main part of the Democratic Party to keep the lid on inside the, the hall where the nomination was actually happening. Outside, there was held a fight with the police and the protesters. What a tumultuous time. So in the middle of that, from the, from the, right from the podium, when they said, Every, everybody stay in their seats, nobody move from their seats. Well, during that, a Georgia delegate got up and some people in plain clothes, they were law enforcement officers, uh, grabbed him and started hustling him out of the hall. Well, as a floor reporter, I said, this is a story. What the hell is going on here? And the guys who were hustling him out of the hall, eventually one of them hit me in the solar plexus and knocked me down because they didn't want me to interview this Georgia delegate. As it turned out later, the Georgia delegate was desperate to go to the men's room. He wasn't repeating any revolution. He just wanted to go up and go to the men's room, but because of the horrors from above, there's nobody moved. So it was a microcosm uh, exposing the extreme effort to keep control of the convention inside as well as control of protests or something else. And it was on live, uh, and Cronkite cut the camera to you just as you were being hit, right? That's correct. And so it, you know, it was on live television, and it went, we would say these days, viral uh, all over. We didn't have the internet at that time. But I think the, the point was it, it, it drew attention to, the, as I say, the really unprecedented effort to keep the control inside the convention hall and outside the convention hall. And it didn't work in either case. Uh, this is the uh, 100th anniversary of the 19th Amendment, given women the right to vote. And I certainly remember a lot of memorable moments at conventions that elevated women in politics, whether it was Ann Richards' speech at the uh, George, uh, uh, opposing George H.W. Uh, Bush, or I think Palin, Margaret, you've written about her. Tell me about, Margaret, let's start with you, some of the most memorable moments that involved women in politics. Well, you know, there's the Geraldine Ferraro moment, which uh, was a first and it was very, very exciting. Um, she ultimately lost. Um, just like Hillary Clinton ultimately lost, but these are not lost on, on women. And it, isn't it fitting that the 100 year anniversary comes as we have the first black woman uh, on the Biden-Harris ticket? Uh, you remember, Walter, I think we had, we were always celebrating the year, the year of the woman in the magazine, and then it turned out not to be the year of the woman. Uh, yeah. But in, uh, after the Clarence Thomas hearing, so that must have been 92, we did have a, a small year of the woman when six women were elected to the Senate. Before that, it had been Mikulski and Kassenbaum were in there. It, it, California elected two women, Boxer and Feinstein. And then this year, we, we, we have Harris. Uh, in 2018, the House turned Democratic, in part because of all the women who were elected. So you get the vote and then it takes a long time for your vote to be appreciated and for your participation. You know, the, in, the, in the rollout of, of Kamala Harris, Senator Harris, there were interviews with all these black women who had done amazing things in their communities and their states that we hadn't heard of that felt like everything they'd done had come to fruition. And Dan, you, uh, you remember when Palin got uh, the vice presidential bid from McCain. Well, I, I, I remember it as if it was yesterday. Again, it was a, a stone cold stunner that nobody expected Tom McCain. But as we now know, he realized he was behind 
and he needed a desperate gamble. In this case, the gamble did not pay off, but it was a long shot gamble uh, to revert, reverse what had become the narrative of the campaign. But you know, even much earlier, as early as 1964, I can remember this was when Lyndon Johnson was essentially renominated and was, but there was a, a renegade uh, delegation from Mississippi uh, represented by a black woman whose name I think was Hammer. Uh, Fanny Lou Hammer. Provided one of, the, one of the more important and brighter moments of that otherwise dull 1964 Democratic Convention uh, when they insisted to be heard and were making the point uh, that number one, people of color were underrepresented at the convention and number two, so were women. What did you think, Margaret, when you first saw, saw Sarah Palin? Because she was electrifying at the convention. Oh, Walter, that speech was so electric. And she was, you know, spectacular. She just had this, this spirit and this presence. And I was so swept away. And I got to write the piece, thank you. And the headline on it was, was and, and I, I want to take this back before I say it, a star is born. That's how good that speech was. And when she, we won't have that this time, a uh, co-campaign, but when she was out on the campaign trail with McCain, she made him 20 years younger. They didn't campaign that much together, but when they did, it was really good for him. The problem was she didn't know very much and she hadn't really seen that much from her front porch in Alaska, certainly not Russia. And she became a caricature after the Katie Couric interview, uh, which shows how you can go up in politics and how you can come down and say in Bill, Hillary Clinton's case, how you can rise again. Margaret, from what I remember, what happens at the convention itself in the hall is sometimes less important than what's happening at all the breakfast, the briefings, the discussions, and for that matter, the socializing and the parties. Why was that so important to the way democracy worked and to the way we covered politics? Well, most of the people that you meet, you don't meet actually on the floor of the convention. I, I won't name a, a, a great journalist who told me, why do you care so much about getting a floor pass? I never go to the floor. Um, and he just hung out in all the places you needed to be. He started with breakfast at 7 and closed the bar at 2 a.m. and then went to an after party. Because in the... It, in the village of the convention, in that area surrounding it and, and, and all the bars and parties, not everybody knows everybody, but everybody acts like they know everybody. So you can walk up and talk to somebody you'd never met, like Donald Trump or actually Bill Clinton, and that would matter later on. And then also they get to know you, whether they're going to talk to you uh, when you pick up the phone. So it, it, all, um, it all matters because it's a, it's a futures game when you're at the convention as well as what's happening uh, right then and there. Give me an example, Dan, or a memory or two of what may have happened to you at the fringes of the convention where you learned something. Well, uh, 1960 was the first year in which I covered both conventions, both the Democrat and Republican conventions. I was not yet at CBS News. I was covering for a regional television network. And a high-ranking member of uh, the Johnson staff, in fact, John Conway, who was governor and the right hand of the president, uh, did take me aside. I didn't know him particularly, but I knew him. did take me aside and he said, don't assume that LBJ won't be on the ticket. And when he said that to me, frankly, I was saying to myself, um, yeah, but I don't think it's very likely. And of course, it turned out to be. So that was a very, very valuable piece of information. I wish I had taken it and run with it a little harder, but I was very sus uh, suspicious of it. Margaret, do you worry that uh, candidates can now just bypass the news media and that what happens on TV and uh, in newspapers doesn't really matter much? Do I ever worry about that? And, and, and does it ever hurt me? Because think about um, the convention we're about to see. It, it could be the Twitter convention in which the first impression people get is from their Twitter feeds, um, skipping us all together because we'll be coming out in, you know, in the middle of the night. Uh, you know, it's, we, were, we were there in the golden age of journalism. So much has happened and so much is lost. 
Um, and I don't think it's just because I'm, I'm in it that I say that. I think someday people will, will come back to the notion that we weren't fake news um, mm -hmm. and that buying a newspaper as a, was, as a citizen was a good thing to do and that it mattered. How you used to learn about what was happening in your government really mattered. Some of the most memorable moments for me at conventions have been the great speeches, whether it was, you know, Ted Kennedy's The Dream Shall Never Die at that 1980 convention we've been talking about, or Jesse Jackson taking the early morning bus. Margo, what's most memorable for you in terms of great convention speeches? Well, the first always being the best. In 1988, George Bush gave a speech that was so unlike George Bush because he had to talk about himself and the great I, which his mother told him never to say. And he had one line in there and he said, I am a quiet man and the, the quiet people hear me. And I thought that is not just him, but it was his presidency in which he almost always did what he thought was right, whether or not we thought it. Uh, and I was just impressed by that. Dan? The one that stands out the most was Barack Obama, who had just been elected a senator from Illinois, uh, made a tremendous speech at what, the 2004 convention. And uh, I interviewed him immediately after that speech. And it, he, as most politicians, he drills you in the eyes. You feel that strong eye contact. But given the speech and the way he handled himself in the, in the wake of that speech, I did find myself saying, uh, there's a great future ahead for him. Uh, I can't say I thought he'd become president of the United States as quickly as he did, but uh, well, for a speech that was not a candidate on the ticket, it was the most memorable talk. A tremendous speech, and every young aspiring politician, whatever their party, could do worse than to take that Obama speech, uh, which vaulted him into the national consciousness as a model for how to make a really convincing speech on television. Dan Rather, Margaret Carlson. I hope I'll see you all at a convention someday in the future, but thanks for being with us this evening. Thank you, Walter. Thanks.